ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we begin by praising allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge with allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions whomsoever allah guides there is none to misguide and whomsoever allah leaves to go astray there is none to guide and i testify and bear witness that allah alone is worthy of worship and that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant of allah and his final messenger after that the best speech is the book of allah and the best guidance is the guidance of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion and every matter that is newly introduced into the religion is an innovation all of the innovations are misguidance all the misguidance is going astray and all the going astray is in the fire today we want to talk about the purpose of life what is the meaning and what is the purpose of our existence as human beings what is the reason for which we are here on this earth what are we supposed to be doing with ourselves it's not something that a dog or a cat or a cow or a lion or an ant or a cockroach seems to have any problem about the cat knows what he has to do so does the cow so does the ant so does the sun so does the moon these creatures or these created things know the reason for which they exist and they spend their existence fulfilling that created purpose but it seems to be unique to the human being that we can ask this question what is the purpose of my life as if we realize that we are something different from the animals there is something about the human being that distinguishes us that separates us that makes us a different type of creation although we eat and we drink and we procreate like the animals there is this fundamental underlying question that is in our mind what are we as human beings supposed to be doing with our lives what is the reason for our existence now every religion and every ideology and every philosophy in one way or another is trying to make sense of this fundamental question by and large we live today in a very materialistic and secular world india professes to be a secular country certainly england 
France, most of the European democracies profess to be secular states. Of course, the Soviet Union clearly defined itself as an atheist, communist society whose ideology was purely materialistic and whose driving force and whose underlying concept was a totally materialistic one. Whereas a secular society recognizes religion, but it just states that religion should not have anything to do with the normal everyday running and affairs of state. But whether the societies claim, for example, in England, some of the politicians sometimes say this is a Christian country and we run our society on Christian principles. The, the fact of the matter is that their true religion and their basic ideology is a materialistic one. And the materialistic society tells us that the purpose of life is life. The reason for your existence is to enjoy and to make the best of your physical existence right here, right now, on this planet. That the way to be happy and to be fulfilled as a human being is by acquiring the material possessions. When you acquire these material possessions, then you will find the happiness and the peace that you are looking for. And just like every religion, every philosophy, they have a rational and scientific justification for this. And this is called the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution aims to root the human being very firmly in the material. This theory must lead the human being to understand and to accept the idea that we are just products of nature, random mutation of DNA. We are a product of natural selection. There is no hand of God. There is no work of the Creator. In fact, there is no need for a God and there is no need for a Creator. If you want to believe in that, well that's fine, you can believe in it if you want to. But now they want to tell us and they would like to us to believe that science has proven, this is how they would claim it, that we are descended from an ape-like creature. So that ourselves and the chimpanzees and the gorillas, we are all descended from a common ancestor. Therefore, the human being and the meaning of the life of the human being is not much more than the life of an animal. In fact, that's all we are, animals. We are just monkeys, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more advanced, but basically the theory of evolution tells us that we are animals. And that the things that make an animal happy are the things that make us happy. So if you have a monkey, how will you keep the monkey happy? You give the monkey some bananas, yeah? You keep the monkey safe from the lions and the leopards and from predators. And you give man monkey, woman monkey, woman monkey, man monkey, and what do you have? A happy monkey. Food, shelter, and uh, sex. That's it. This is what the animal needs. This is the instinct of the animal. This is the passion of the animal. This is the driving force of the animal. And when the animal has food, when the animal has shelter, when the animal has a mate, you have a happy animal. So therefore the human being is not really any different. Give the human being food, give the human being uh, shelter, give 
you know, the human being a mate, and that's it. You have a happy human being. This is the idea behind materialism. Give the human being food, give the human being uh, shelter, give, uh, you know, the human being a mate, and that's it. You have a happy human being. This is the idea behind materialism. That you should satisfy your passions and your animal instincts. And all this open sexuality and nudity and fornication and even now homosexuality is all just part of your natural instincts and you should satisfy your natural passions. This is what they say. Because they're trying to claim that homosexuality even is also natural. That you have homosexual genes and some people are just like that. So they should just do it because that's just in their instinct. And the way for you to be happy is by following your instincts and your passions. This is the claim of the consumer society, the materialistic society. And most of us are caught up in this. We say we are Muslim. We say we are Muslim. But in reality, most of us are worshippers of the dunya. We claim we are worshippers of Allah, but most of us, we are no different than the Hindu, than the Christian, than the Buddhist, than the normal person. Us and them together, we really believe, actually, most of us, that happiness comes from having a nice wife or a nice husband, a, you know, one man, one woman, you know, there's two of us and two of them. That's what they say in India, yes? Two of us and two of them. You see, that's nice, that's, that's good. You know, man, woman, two kids, that's okay. And we have a nice house, and we have a nice car, and we have a nice life. And this is our aim. The religion is only something that goes along with that. Maybe it's to do with our culture. Maybe it's to do with our society. Whatever. The fact is that most people follow their religion because that's what their ancestors were following. But really their true religion, the true, the thing that they really believe is going to make them happy in life are the material things. And this in fact is truly the religion that most people follow. Because actually let us examine this question. What is a God? What is actually a God? When we say something is a God and that people worship it, what, what is it? Here in India, they have many, many gods and idols which they worship. Why do they worship those gods and why do they worship those idols? What do they believe they are going to get from it? Something, yes? Yes, they believe that. True or not? Okay, so why do people worship a God? What is a God? Your God is the thing that you believe is going to give you what you want. That's your God. The thing that you believe is going to give you what you want is your God. So if you think that Ganesh is the means through which you are going to get what you want. And I don't know much about the Hindu religion. I don't know much about it. But anyway, in many religions, they will worship different gods. If I want to have a child, I will worship the God that helps me have the child, the fertility God. Or if I'm going to go into battle, I will worship the God of war. And if I want the rain to fall, I will worship the God of rain. And because I believe that is the thing that is going to give me what I want and what I need. Yes? By worshipping that thing, by sacrificing to that thing, to praying to that thing, this is what I believe is going to give me what I want. Yes? So this is the God 
and the sacrifice and the prayer and the worship is the religion that is given to this God. If we understand this concept, this wide concept of what a God is, we will also understand that people, they put their faith and they put their trust and their hope and their expectations and they approach this thing with reverence and awe and humility. This is their worship of that thing. These are some gods that it's very obvious that this is a god. But there are other types of things which people take as a god which is not so obvious. But they are just as much gods which people worship. And they put their faith in it and their trust in it and their hope in it. And one of those gods is money. Is money. Dollars, pounds. Yen, Deutschmark, well they don't have Deutschmark anymore, Euro, Rupee. How can a person worship money? You say, how can they worship money? We don't pray to money, we don't sacrifice to money, we don't put the money up on our shelf and, and pray to it and sacrifice to it, but still we worship it. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. Woe be to the worshipper. Woe means like misery and unhappiness. Or some scholars said, Wail, Wail in Arabic, Wail, we translate it as woe, is a valley in the hellfire. It's a valley in the hellfire. So, woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. How can we worship the dinar and the dirham? That was the name of the currency or the money in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. People worship money because they put their faith in it. And they put their trust in it. And they put their hope in it. And they believe that when they have money, they will be happy. And when they have money, they will be successful. And they believe that money is the cause of their happiness and their success in life. So when they have it, they are happy. And when they don't have it, they are sad. This person is the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. Because they really have their hope and their expectation and their fear and their trust in their money. Also the Prophet وسلم, said, Woe be to the worshipper of the finely embroidered cloth. There are some people who worship fashion. They are worshippers of fashion. If they have the latest clothes, the latest style, the latest fashion, the latest shoes, the latest everything, they are happy and they look and they think that people are admiring me and they are respecting me and this makes them happy. So when they have these things, they feel secure, they feel happy and they put their faith in this and their trust in this. And this is the source they believe of their happiness in life. So they pursue it and they run after it. And if they don't have the latest clothes and they don't have the latest fashions, they are miserable and they are sad. This type of person can become the worshipper of fashion. It becomes a god to them. Just as much as the idol is a god, money can be a god. Fame can be a god. Power and prestige can be a god. Having a high position in society can be a god. But your god is the thing that you believe is going to give you what you want. And what do you want? You want success. You want happiness. So the thing that you believe is the source of your success and happiness, that is your God. So this is truly the correct understanding of what a God is and what religion is. Islam is telling us that in reality, all of these gods are false. 
All of these gods are false. All these things that you put your faith and your trust and your hope in, they will not be able to give you what you want and what you need. Not money, not fame, not fashion, or the idols, or any of the things that people worship. They actually, none of them can give you what you want and what you need. Because all of them, actually themselves, are helpless. And can achieve nothing and do nothing, except that the one who created them and controls them, allows it. So in fact, the only true source of success and the only one that we should really put our faith and our trust and our hope in is not money, not fame, not fashion, not the world and not these other things that people worship but the one who has created them all and who controls them all. This is what it means to worship Allah alone. This is what La ilaha illallah means. Not only that we make our salah only to Allah, and we make our dua only to Allah, of course that is very important. But also it means that we put our trust in Allah, our faith in Allah, our hope in Allah. And the reason that we have been created the Qur'an tells us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That Allah did not create the human being and the jinn, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Except that we should choose to worship Him alone. As Allah, He said in the Qur'an, وَلَكَدْ بَأَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَن نَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُ الْتَغُوتِ that Allah says in the Quran, we did not send a messenger to any nation except that He called the people and Na'budullah to worship Allah, Wajtanibud Taqut, and to reject all of the false gods. This is the purpose. To worship Allah, not to believe only that Allah exists. Not to believe only that Allah is the Lord and the Creator and the Sustainer, but that we should put our faith in Him and our trust in Him and our hope in Him. Na'budullah, to worship Allah. We have been created to worship Allah and to worship Him alone and to abandon the worship of everything else other than Allah. This is the purpose of life. How can a person worship money? You say, how can they worship money? We don't pray to money. We don't sacrifice to money. We don't put the money up on our shelf and, and pray to it and sacrifice to it. But still we worship it. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. Woe be to the worshipper. Woe means like misery and unhappiness. Or some scholars said, Wail, Wail in Arabic, Wail, we translate it as woe, is a valley in the hellfire. It's a valley in the hellfire. So, woe be to the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. How can we worship the dinar and the dirham? That was the name of the currency or the money in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. People worship money because they put their faith in it, and they put their trust in it, and they put their hope in it, and they believe that when they have money, they will be happy. And when they have money, they will be successful. And they believe that money is the cause of their happiness and their success in life. So when they have it, they are happy. And when they don't have it, they are sad. This person is the worshipper of the dinar and the dirham. Because they really have their hope and their expectation and their fear and their trust in their money. Also the Prophet wasallam said, Woe be to the worshipper of the finely embroidered cloth. 
There are some people who worship fashion. They're worshippers of fashion. If they have the latest clothes, the latest style, the latest fashion, the latest shoes, the latest everything, they are happy and they look and they think that people are admiring me and they are respecting me and this makes them happy. So when they have these things, they feel secure, they feel happy and they put their faith in this and their trust in this. And this is the source they believe of their happiness in life. So they pursue it and they run after it. And if they don't have the latest clothes and they don't have the latest fashions, they are miserable and they are sad. This type of person can become the worshipper of fashion. It becomes a god to them. Just as much as the idol is a god, money can be a god. Fame can be a god. Power and prestige can be a god. Having a high position in society can be a god. But your god is the thing that you believe is going to give you what you want. And what do you want? You want success. You want happiness. So the thing that you believe is the source of your success and happiness, that is your God. So this is truly the correct understanding of what a God is and what religion is. Islam is telling us that in reality, all of these gods are false. All of these gods are false. All these things that you put your faith and your trust and your hope in, they will not be able to give you what you want and what you need. Not money, not fame, not fashion, or the idols, or any of the things that people worship. They actually, none of them can give you what you want and what you need. Because all of them, actually themselves, are helpless and can achieve nothing and do nothing except that the one who created them and controls them allows it. So in fact, the only true source of success and the only one that we should really put our faith and our trust and our hope in is not money, not fame, not fashion, not the world, and not these other things that people worship, but the one who has created them all and who controls them all. This is what it means to worship Allah alone. This is what La ilaha illallah means. Not only that we make our salah only to Allah and we make our dua only to Allah, of course that is very important. But also it means that we put our trust in Allah, our faith in Allah, our hope in Allah. And the reason that we have been created, the Quran tells us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That Allah did not create the human being and the jinn, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Except that we should choose to worship Him alone. As Allah, He said in the Quran, وَلَكَدْ بَأَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَن نَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُ الْتَغُوتِ That Allah says in the Quran, we did not send a messenger to any nation except that He called the people أَن نَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ to worship Allah وَاجْتَنِبُ الْتَغُوتِ and to reject all of the false gods. This is the purpose. To worship Allah, not to believe only that Allah exists, not to believe only that Allah is the Lord and the Creator and the Sustainer, but that we should put our faith in Him and our trust in Him and our hope in Him. Na'budullah, to worship Allah. We have been created to worship Allah and to worship Him alone and to abandon the worship of everything else other than Allah. This is the purpose of life. So what is ibadah? We have talked about it. We have tried to get a deep understanding of this concept of ibadah by understanding why do people worship something? Why do they put their faith in it and their trust in it? 
So ibadah is something very comprehensive. When we translate some words from Arabic into English or any other language, in fact, what unfortunately happens is we lose a lot of the meaning that is implicit in that word. So when we talk about worship, the English word worship has a very narrow, confined understanding. Usually most people imagine worship means a few ritual actions like some prayers or burning some incense or going to Jum'ah, fasting, Ramadan, okay, depending on the religion. But we view these ritual acts as worship. And it's true, they are worship. But actually the term ibadah covers much, much more than that. One scholar, he defined ibadah as this. He said, ibadah is everything which Allah loves and everything which Allah is pleased with. From the actions of the heart and the actions of the limbs. Okay, this is ibadah. So if you remember this, it would be very beneficial for you to remember this definition of ibadah. It would be good for you to write it down with a pen and paper because this helps you to memorize. Ibadah is everything which Allah loves and is pleased with from the action of the heart and the action of the limbs. Yes? So this is ibadah. So we have been created by Allah to try and make every single action of the heart and every single action of the limbs to do all of them in a way that Allah loves and Allah is pleased with. Therefore ibadah is comprehending everything in our life, every moment of our life every aspect of our life. And we have been created by Allah to try and achieve. So this is the goal that we are aiming for. We may never reach the perfection of that goal, but at least we can say, that's what I'm trying to get to. That is what I am aiming for. We should have that in our mind, that we should try to do everything in our life in a way that Allah loves and is pleased with, internally and externally. Now, we have to explain this. What do we mean by actions of the heart? What on earth does that mean? What is an action of the heart? Can anyone tell me what is an action of the heart? Intention, Jazakallah khair, that is an action of the heart. Niyyah, your intention, the reason you do something. I am going to pray, I am going to give a speech about Islam. Why am I going to give a speech about Islam? Because I want everybody to admire me. And I want the whole world to be talking about what a beautiful lecturer Abdurrahim is. And isn't he handsome? And isn't he so enchanting? And I will be so popular in the world. This is an intention a person may have. But is this type of intention pleasing to Allah? No. This is not pleasing to Allah. The intention that is pleasing to Allah is that I am talking about Islam in order that the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be made the highest. And it is not my concern whether you like what I say or you don't like what I say. It is not my responsibility to make you happy. It is my responsibility to let you know what Islam teaches. Whether I am popular or unpopular should not be what motivates me. I should be motivated by seeking the face of Allah, seeking His pleasure, 
and seeking the reward of Allah and to avoid His punishment, that Allah has given me some knowledge. And therefore my duty is to pass on that knowledge to the best of my ability. Now, is this a good intention? Yes. So this niyyah, which is an action of the heart, it's not a statement like some people make this niyyah. This is a bid'ah. This is an innovation. And it is not the practice of the Prophet ﷺ. And to make niyyah with your mouth is to not understand what niyyah is. Niyyah is not a statement with, I intend to pray for rakah of dhuhr at 1.30 p.m. on such and such day and this and that. And some people do this. This is not niyyah. Because you can say this with your tongue and still your niyyah is not correct. Niyyah means in Arabic, it is an intention. It's an outpouring from your heart. Your firm resolve to do something. That is the niya. The niya means the firm resolve in your heart to do something. So it is an action of the heart, not a statement of the tongue. This is niya. This is an action of the heart. So give me another action of the heart. Huh? Hope. Okay, let's take hope. What do I put my hope in? What do I put my hope in? I hope in something. I hope that such and such thing will happen. What do I believe is the source of that hope? What do I believe is the motivator of that hope? Do I put my hope in Allah? Or do I put my hope in other than Allah? And connected with hope is trust. Who do I put my trust in? What do I put my trust in? Is my trust in my bank accounts and how much money I've got in my bank accounts? Or is my trust in Allah? The test comes, brothers and sisters. The test comes in these type of things when someone is asking you. Someone who needs your money. Someone who needs your help. A poor person. Or some person doing something for the sake of Allah or for the sake of Islam. And you have that money. And that is not money you need it immediately. And it's not right that you should, you know, you, you should regulate your money and you know you have to pay your rent and alhamdulillah that's correct. But you have some money. But really, for you, your hope is in your money. And even though Allah has told you, spend, O son of Adam, and I will spend on you. Even though the Prophet ﷺ has told you that you will never lose because of sadaqah. Even though Allah and His Messenger have told you that when you spend and when you do any good deed, Allah will increase it for you at a minimum of 10 times up to 700 times or even more than that as Allah wills. Now where is your trust? Is your trust in Allah and what He says? Or is your trust in those figures in your bank account that's right in front of you? Now that's, that's where we see what do you really put your trust in? Allah has made it haram to take interest, to deal in riba. But how many people have taken a mortgage? How many people have borrowed money from the bank at interest? So they can have a house and I can buy my house. You could rent. You could rent a house. I have been a Muslim for now 16 years. When I first became Muslim, the first talk I heard about Islam, the first lecture I went to was a lecture about khamar and riba. That khamar was haram, which I didn't actually know. <laughs> I'd been practicing Islam for about six months. I didn't know khamar was haram, but alhamdulillah, I'd stopped. I stopped it just from thinking this is rubbish. And I didn't know riba, and at the time I had a mortgage. So I phoned up my friend and I was sharing the house. I said, we're going to sell the house today. I didn't say, I, yes, in my mind, shaitan was going, how are you going to live? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? I said, listen, if Allah, He made it haram for me, that's it, it's haram. Allah will provide for me and my trust is in Allah. And for 16 years, I've been living in rented accommodation, alhamdulillah, very comfortably. But where is your trust, brothers and sisters? Is your trust in Allah? 
Or is your trust in these material things that you think? You think it, you imagine it. This is the test. This is to see really who do you put your trust in? Who do you put your faith in? It is in Allah or other than Allah. So what is another action of the heart? Another action of the heart. Uh, what is the heart famous for? Love. The heart is famous for love. Okay. Who do you love? Why do you love them? How much do you love them? Love is an act of worship. If it is directed correctly, it becomes worship for Allah. If it is directed incorrectly, it can even become shirk. You can even make someone a partner with Allah in your love. In fact, Allah mentions in the Quran the meaning of which is that there are some people who love others as they should love Allah. There are some people who love other people as they should love Allah. But you will find the believers, they are overflowing with their love for Allah. And what is this love? This love is the love of submission. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned in the Quran, because some of the mushriks in the time of the Prophet, they used to say, we love Allah. You say you love Allah Muslims, we love Allah too. I am sure you'll find people, you'll find Hindus and definitely you'll find Christians. They say, we love God. So Allah, He gave a criterion in the Quran. He gave a test in the Quran. He gave the means to show who are the people who love him and who are the people who only claim it. Kul. Allah said to the Prophet, say, Kul, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fatabiyuni yahbibkum Allah. Say, if it's true that you love Allah, follow me. The Prophet said, if you really love Allah, Make ittiba of me, follow me, and then Allah will love you. And then Allah will forgive you your sins. So the test and the truth of the matter is that a person who loves Allah will follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And anyone who claims to love God, who does not follow the Prophet Muhammad, their claim is a lie and Allah rejects their claim. Because the test of whether you truly love Allah is following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the Prophet Muhammad is the one who has brought the guidance from Allah and the revelation from Allah and the means through which and by which we can know what Allah loves and what Allah hates, what Allah wants us to do and what Allah wants us to abandon. It is through this that we know the revelation and it is the only way we know through revelation. How can we worship Allah and how can we obey our Lord? So this is love. This is an action of the heart. But this action of the heart leads to the actions of the limbs. Okay? And the same with fear and khushur. Khushur means reverential awe. All of these and many other actions of the heart, these are acts of worship. And they must be directed to Allah in a way that is pleasing to Allah. And they all have means and ways that we can direct them to other than Allah, which is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can know this by studying Allah's revelation. Yes? So worship means internally here to make our love of our heart in a way that is pleasing to Allah. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that it doesn't matter how much you pray and how much you fast and how much charity you give. You will never taste Helwatil Iman, the sweetness of Iman, the sweetness of faith, until you love Allah and His Messenger more than anything else. Until you give for the sake of Allah and you withhold for the sake of Allah. You love for the sake of Allah and you hate for the sake of Allah. You meet for the sake of Allah and you depart for the sake of Allah. Until you have that quality, my brothers and sisters, you will never taste how beautiful and how sweet and how lovely this beautiful deen of Islam is. So this is something to achieve, this is something to aim for, this is something to yearn for. And the action of the limbs, it's obvious what is the action of the limbs, yes? Praying, fasting, making pilgrimage, enjoying the right, 
forbidding the wrong, fighting jihad, huh? how we dress, how we talk, how we behave, our manners, our akhlaq, our adab. This is all the actions of the limbs, even how we go to the toilet. Even how we go to the toilet. Islam has something to say about that. Even that can be done in a way that is pleasing to Allah in a way that Allah loves and is pleased with. And this is all taught to us in the revelation. So my brothers and sisters, this is the purpose of our life. To try to do everything in our life in a way that Allah loves and Allah is pleased with. You may not reach that, almost definitely, it will be very hard to reach that every day, all the days of your life. But at least we can try. And this is our purpose. And Allah did not create us for any other purpose except that. This is very important to realize. And in this is the nobility, and this is the happiness, and this is the true peace, and in this is the true tranquility. This is the purpose of the life of the human being. Let me ask you a question, something to think about. How do you think, how pleasant do you think the life of a cat would be if the cat spent its whole life thinking it was a dog. You know cats and dogs are always fighting? Yes? You don't know? Or you know? <laughs> okay. So if the cat thinks he's a dog, how pleasant is the life of the cat going to be? It's not going to be pleasant at all. Imagine the deer thinks he's a lion, or the sheep thinks he's a wolf. Will the life of this animal be happy? No. How about the human being? He thinks his life is about running after this dunya, but Allah did not create him for that. Allah has made it haram to take interest, to deal in riba. But how many people have taken a mortgage? How many people have borrowed money from the bank at interest? So they can have a house and I can buy my house. You could rent. You could rent a house. I have been a Muslim for now 16 years. When I first became Muslim, the first talk I heard about Islam, the first lecture I went to was a lecture about khamar and riba. That khamar was haram, which I didn't actually know. <laughs> I've been practicing Islam for about six months. I didn't know khamar was haram, but alhamdulillah, it stopped. I stopped it just from thinking this is rubbish. And I didn't know riba, and at the time I had a mortgage. So I phoned up my friend and I was sharing the house. I said, we're going to sell the house today. I didn't say, I, yes, in my mind, shaitan was going, how are you going to live? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? I said, listen, if Allah, he made it haram for me, that's it, it's haram. Allah will provide for me and my trust is in Allah. And for 16 years, I've been living in rented accommodation, alhamdulillah, very comfortably. But where is your trust, brothers and sisters? Is your trust in Allah? Or is your trust in these material things that you think? You think it, you imagine it. This is the test. This is to see really who do you put your trust in? Who do you put your faith in? It is in Allah or other than Allah. So what is another action of the heart? Another action of the heart. Uh, what is the heart famous for? Love. The heart is famous for love. Okay. Who do you love? Why do you love them? How much do you love them? Love is an act of worship. If it is directed correctly, it becomes worship for Allah. If it is directed incorrectly, it can even become shirk. You can even make someone a partner with Allah in your love. In fact, Allah mentions in the Quran the meaning of which is that there are some people who love others as they should love Allah. There are some people who love other people as they should love Allah. But you will find the believers, they are overflowing with their love for Allah. And what is this love? This love is the love of submission. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned in the Quran, because some of the mushriks in the time of the Prophet, they used to say, we love Allah, 
You say you love Allah Muslims, we love Allah too. I am sure you'll find people, you'll find Hindus and definitely you'll find Christians. They say we love God. So Allah, He gave a criterion in the Quran. He gave a test in the Quran. He gave the means to show who are the people who love Him and who are the people who only claim it. Kul. Allah said to the Prophet, say, Kul, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fatabiyuni yahbibkum Allah. Say, if it's true that you love Allah, follow me. The Prophet said, if you really love Allah, Make ittiba of me, follow me, and then Allah will love you. And then Allah will forgive you your sins. So the test and the truth of the matter is that a person who loves Allah will follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And anyone who claims to love God, who does not follow the Prophet Muhammad, their claim is a lie and Allah rejects their claim. Because the test of whether you truly love Allah is following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because the Prophet Muhammad is the one who has brought the guidance from Allah and the revelation from Allah and the means through which and by which we can know what Allah loves and what Allah hates, what Allah wants us to do and what Allah wants us to abandon. It is through this that we know the revelation and it is the only way we know through revelation. How can we worship Allah and how can we obey our Lord? So this is love. This is an action of the heart. But this action of the heart leads to the actions of the limbs. Okay? And the same with fear and khushur. Khushur means reverential awe. All of these and many other actions of the heart, these are acts of worship. And they must be directed to Allah in a way that is pleasing to Allah. And they all have means and ways that we can direct them to other than Allah, which is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can know this by studying Allah's revelation. Yes? So worship means internally here, to make our love of our heart in a way that is pleasing to Allah. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that it doesn't matter how much you pray and how much you fast and how much charity you give. You will never taste Halwatil Iman, the sweetness of Iman, the sweetness of faith, until you love Allah and His Messenger more than anything else. Until you give for the sake of Allah and you withhold for the sake of Allah. You love for the sake of Allah and you hate for the sake of Allah. You meet for the sake of Allah and you depart for the sake of Allah. Until you have that quality, my brothers and sisters, you will never taste how beautiful and how sweet and how lovely this beautiful deen of Islam is. So this is something to achieve, this is something to aim for, this is something to yearn for. And the action of the limbs, it's obvious what is the action of the limbs, yes? Praying, fasting, making pilgrimage, enjoying the right, forbidding the wrong, fighting jihad, huh? how we dress, how we talk, how we behave, our manners, our akhlaq, our adab, this is all the actions of the limbs. Even how we go to the toilet, even how we go to the toilet, Islam has something to say about that. Even that can be done in a way that is pleasing to Allah, in a way that Allah loves and is pleased with. And this is all taught to us in the revelation. So my brothers and sisters, this is the purpose of our life. To try to do everything in our life in a way that Allah loves and Allah is pleased with. You may not reach that, almost definitely, it will be very hard to reach that every day, all the days of your life. But at least we can try. And this is our purpose. And Allah did not create us for any other purpose except that. This is very important to realize. And in this is the nobility, and this is the happiness, and this is the true peace, and in this is the true tranquility. This is the purpose of the life of the human being. Let me ask you a question, something to think about. How do you think, how pleasant do you think the life of a cat would be if the cat spent its whole life thinking it was a dog? 
You know cats and dogs are always fighting? Yes? You don't know? Or you know? Okay. So if the cat thinks he's a dog, how pleasant is the life of the cat going to be? It's not going to be pleasant at all. Imagine the deer thinks he's a lion. Or the sheep thinks he's a wolf. Will the life of this animal be happy? No. How about the human being? He thinks his life is about running after this dunya, but Allah did not create him for that. Allah did not create her for that. Allah created the human being to worship him. In the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find rest. This dunya is only there for one reason. The only benefit of this whole dunya is that we can use it in order to get closer to Allah. That's it. You use the dunya in order to get closer to Allah. Apart from that, it has no benefits. That's it. Your life is very short. And this is another illusion that it's amazing that although on one hand the materialist, on one hand the materialist teaches that life is a random event, we are like animals, that's it, we live and we die. Really in reality they always forget the dead bit. They leave that. And they somehow imagine in spite of things dying in front of them constantly the whole time, people seem to live under this illusion that they are going to live on this earth forever. So they build fantastic houses and amazing palaces and they surround themselves with wealth and all sorts of things as if they are going to be enjoying this forever. And really believe me, some of them actually really have this idea. They don't think they're going to die. My father, may Allah guide him to Islam, he's 82 now, 82. And he told me last year, for the first time in my life, I feel mortal. For the first time in my life, I feel mortal. That means my dad has eight, only after 82 years, has my dad suddenly realized that I am going to die. It's taken him that long. And my dad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a lot of strength. You know, if you meet my dad, most of you, he'd, he'd beat you in tennis easily. Allah gave him this strength and this energy. But the disadvantage of that is that he imagined, I'm never going to die. And people fool themselves with that. And only maybe when they get very old and they get weak and they start realizing, wait a minute, my strength has left me. And I'm 82 years old and no one is really going to live beyond 90, maybe 100 maximum. You realize suddenly, no, death is going to come. But maybe that's much too late to start realizing that fact. And also, we don't know when death is going to come. How many people live to my father's age? Very few. Most people die long before that. So the other reality we have to be aware of, that the meaning of life is actually not life itself, but the meaning of life is the end of life. So the other reality we have to be aware of, that the meaning of life is actually not life itself, but the meaning of life is the end of life. The true meaning of life is the end of life. And this is explained so beautifully in a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "What have I got to do with this world? I am like a rider on a journey who has taken rest underneath the shade of a tree and then continues on his journey." Let us think about this beautiful, beautiful similitude. This allegory that the Prophet ﷺ has given us about this dunya, about this world. This world is like a man, first of all, you imagine someone on a long journey, especially in those days, through the desert, in the heat, traveling for many, many hours, many, many days, in fact, perhaps many weeks. So imagine you are on your camel in the desert, traveling for many days. 
What would happen, do you think, if you did not stop and take a rest? If you did not stop and take a rest, you will not complete your journey because you will fall off your camel, maybe in the night or the day, from exhaustion, the camel would keep going and you would be left in the desert alone to die. You need that rest. That rest is very important because that moment that you take to rest gives you more strength to carry on your journey and to reach your destination. Yes? So when the man is sitting underneath the shade of the tree, he is getting what he needs in order to complete his journey. This is part of his za'ad, his provision, his provision. Okay? So this is our existence. Our existence is like a long journey from when Allah He created us until we reach our destination. But our destination is not this world. No! This world is like the rider who takes the shade underneath the tree. That tree and that shade is not his destination, is it? He doesn't say that, oh, that's how I've arrived now, I've reached my destination, here I'm going to stay. No. His destination is some city or some town or some place. He's only resting briefly to take what he needs. This is this life, brothers and sisters. This life for us on this earth is like a man resting underneath the shade of a tree on a journey. We are here just to take what we need in order to reach our destination. And what is our destination that we want to reach, that we desire to reach? It is paradise. And the destination that we want to avoid is the hellfire. And the stage that we have to pass before we get there is the day of judgment. And what is Allah going to reckon for us? And what is Allah going to account for us? Except our deeds. Good deeds and bad deeds. So what do we need from this life? Good deeds. That is the provision we need from this life. That is what we need to take from this world. Good deeds so that we can reach our destination of paradise. But most people, my brothers and sisters, they are fools. They imagine that this is the destination. They have been confused and they have been taken in by the life of this world. And they have been deceived by the life of this world. And they imagine this is the destination. Here I am, I've arrived. What a beautiful world it is. Look at the sun, look at the trees, look at these nice things. And they amass the wealth and they build nice houses and they have palaces for themselves and cars and they believe this is it. So they do everything they can to acquire the things of this world. But the reality is they will die and they will not take any of it with them. And then they will see the true reality and they will see that they have prepared nothing for their journey. And when they meet Allah on the day of judgment, what deeds will they have? What deeds will they have? Nothing. They acquired nothing with their deeds. They got no benefit from it. Because they didn't do it. And even the things they did, they didn't do that. Hoping that they will have something waiting for them in the next life. These people who did, in some of them, it's true, they do do good deeds. They do good deeds. But these good deeds will only benefit them in the life of this world. They did not do that seeking the hereafter. It's no good if you have a bank account and you just put your money in the bank account. All you will get is what you put in. But if you invest your money in a business or in, in the terms of the kuffar, if you put it in an interest bearing account, it's not halal for us, but I'm just giving you an example. If you put it in an interest bearing account, then you not only have your money, but you have what you have earned on top of it. Yes? You have the interest you have earned, so you're making something. You can't put your money in a normal account and expect that you will get the return on it. You will not. So a person who invests all their effort in the dunya, how can they expect that they are going to get something 
and the akhirah when they meet Allah because they did not invest in that. They only invested in the dunya. This is another explanation why the deeds of the disbelievers are of no benefit to them on the day of judgment. They are of no benefit to them on the day of judgment because they invested only in this life. They did not invest in the akhirah. They did not invest in the life to come. And the only way you can invest in the life to come is by following what Allah wants us to follow, by investing the way Allah wants us to invest. By obeying Him and obeying His Messenger according to what He has revealed. By worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this my brothers and sisters is another very important thing to realize about the life of the human being, the meaning of the life. The meaning of life actually is not this life. The meaning of life is the day that we are going to stand in front of Allah and He is going to weigh up for us and He is going to account for us the things that we did, the good and the bad. And we will be rewarded and punished accordingly. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We move on to question and answers. Sir, I want to know in what way the Almighty is benefited by our prayers. We are only benefited by their prayers. No, Allah does not need anything from us. Allah does not benefit from our prayers at all. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the self-sufficient. He's a samad. Everything needs Allah and He needs no one. And Allah needs nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that we should pray to Him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that we should worship Him. Because this is a proof of our recognition of our need for Allah. Of our complete dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah has no need from it whatsoever. So this is a very wrong notion that some people have. Is that somehow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, benefits uh, or needs our prayers. Or some people imagine that for example, that the more people are worshipping their God, the stronger the power of their God becomes. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who already possesses all the strength and all the power. And if Allah wants to destroy us, He only needs to say one word. If Allah wanted, He could make everyone believe. Or everyone disbelieve, this is easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something very important to understand that fact. Is it necessary to believe in the position of jinns to be good Muslim? Is there any uh, proof for that? Yes, believing in the jinn is something that uh, is from our aqidah, it's from our belief. Uh, it is mentioned, the jinn are mentioned in the Quran. There is even a surah called Surah Al-Jinn. And in fact we have many a hadith uh, also from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, explaining and talking about the jinn and indeed Iblis is shaitan is one of the jinn. So most definitely to believe in the existence of the jinn and to believe in uh, their capabilities and everything that has been told to us about the jinn in the Quran and in the authentic traditions is an essential part of our belief as Muslims. Without a doubt, it is something from the belief of the Muslims. The possession, the jinn possessing human beings is something that is proven both from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we have authentic hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to exercise jinn and this was also the practice of the Sahaba. And it's also proven through uh, experience of human beings, both Muslim and non-Muslim. So uh, jinn possession without a doubt is a fact. Uh, and it is something that is real. And it is proven by the uh, authentic sayings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And in fact it is mentioned also even in the Quran. That the people who take riba will not stand on the day of judgment. Except as one who the shaitan has made mad. Meaning he's majnoon. Majnoon in Arabic means possessed by a jinn. So even the Quran mentions that the person who deals in riba on the day of judgment 
will stand as a possessed person, a person who's been possessed by the devil. So even this we find in the Quran is mentioning the possession of the jinn and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wallahu alim, Allah knows best.